Hello everybody and welcome from me and Dimitri to this week's Easy 11 Plus live lesson where we're looking at some more advanced maths problems and it's a real treat this week because some of the maths is really really difficult so as I said last time if you don't understand many of the things that I'm doing don't worry about it see it as a, ch see it as a challenge see it as a puzzle and if you're putting for a really pushing for a really competitive school with a really difficult exam do your best to understand it and come back to the worksheet and practice and otherwise see it as an opportunity to see some of the maths that you know in a slightly more challenging context why are you so floppy Dimitri so that's because I was asleep and you woke me up Oh, you poor boy. Right, uh, don't forget to check out the links in the video description down below on YouTube, up there on Facebook. There are lots of useful things, including some really helpful free things that you can download and use right now if you're preparing for your 11 plus exam. Don't forget that the worksheet for today's lesson is also linked in the video description. Um, and if you haven't had a look at the worksheet yet, I strongly recommend that you print it out and have a go at these questions yourself in your own time. A big shout out to uh, Fafali's cat Cotton in the comments and hello to all the people whose comments are now starting to trickle in. It's really good to have you here. Fantastic as always to see so many people turning up for a live lesson. And hello to all the people who aren't watching this live and to come back and watch this video at some point in the future, whether it's a few days in the future or who knows, a few years in the future maybe a few centuries, maybe this video will still be kicking around on the internet, watched by almost nobody long after we're all dead and gone. That's, I don't know if that's a hopeful thought or a terrifying one. Before we get too deeply into it, let's get on with today's lesson. And here's the worksheet. We're starting from question six. The worksheet from last time had questions one to five and we covered those last week. You can find that video on the channel. Right, let's get cracking. So this is a style of question that does actually turn up in, um, you know, every now and then in, I would say, normal level. In other words, not ridiculously advanced 11 plus exams. And once you know how to do these problems, they really aren't too difficult. We're told that 387 times 46 equals 17,802. Notice the bold in the question. Using this information, solve the following problems include working to demonstrate how you reach each result. So if you set it out like this, you will not get the marks. You will in fact almost certainly not get any marks. So if you write 3.87 times 460 and then you do the multiplication, you're not doing it right. They're not testing your ability to perform a multiplication. They're testing your ability to manipulate this information to get a relevant answer. So let's try that. We're going to start by writing down this line here. 387 times 46 equals 17802. We're trying to get to 3.87 times 360. And we're going to do this and we're going to show our progress by changing one thing at a time. So, oh, yeah. So let's first of all change 46 into 460 because that's easy to do. 387 times 460 equals. So, what have we done? We've added a times 10 at the end of this row. So, therefore, we also need to times this by 10. If we times this by 10, our result here is also going to be times by 10. So, that's going to become 17802. Oh, because of course, if you times by 10, you add a zero on the end. 178,020, but we don't really need to think in those terms. We just need to think about the columns of numbers and moving zeros and dots about. But we're trying to get to 3.87 times 460, not 387. So now let's adjust this number. So 3.87 times 460 equals. So what have you done here? We've put a decimal point in two places from the end of this number. In other words, we've divided it by 10 and then 100. So we need to do the same to our answer. So that's going to be 178020, but with the decimal point, one, two places from the end. So 1780.2, because 0 0.20 is just 0 0.2. So that's our answer, 1780.2. If you happen to have spare time at the end of the exam, it's well worth coming back and checking it by doing the calculation that I showed before. 3.87 times 460 
and do that calculation and check that you get the same answer. But that isn't a priority as you're going through the paper under time conditions because it takes extra time you may not have. If you've done this here and you've done it systematically, then you should be confident of the answer. Of course, you can do it in a different order. You could, for example, start by doing 3.87 times 46. So you'd get 178.02. And then you add a zero to the 460. You say you times by, by that by 10 and you move the decimal point point one place to the right that works as well you could also do it do this bit here in two stages so you could divide by 10 moving the decimal point one place and then divide by another 10 moving it another place there are lots of ways of doing it all that matters is that you show a clear path from starting with this to point out it again working through to the answer by manipulating what we've got okay I hope that makes sense JD says, you don't call him sir, you call him Robert. You can call me sir if you want to, although it's unnecessary. Um, I personally prefer to be addressed as High Lord of the Universe, um, but I'll accept Robert if that's a little bit too much of a mouthful for you. On to the next one. Now this one is a fair bit trickier, I think, and this is where we're pushing into really advanced maths paper territory. This is the kind of thing that you might not expect to see in a more standard level 11 plus exam. But I think it is still at a level that could turn up in a really challenging one. Um, so for example, um, for some of the uh, really competitive independent schools that really push the boundary of primary school maths in their entrance exams. Ah, tea this week, I'm just mixing things up. It's actually because I realized I didn't have any coffee left. Panic, um, about three minutes before the lesson, so there wasn't time for that. Anyway, uh, not if you want proper coffee and Anyone but a barbarian makes proper coffee. 38.7.4.6 over 1780.2. Let's start by writing down again what we started with. 387 times 46 equals 17802. So um, how, we might need a bit more space here. Let's do it on the left hand side here. So um, actually, I'm going to copy across from my uh, here's one I did earlier, just so I don't have to keep scrolling up and down. That's cunning. You don't need Blue Peter when you got me. Three, is Blue Peter still even on? Probably. I was on Blue Peter once through when I was very young. 387 times 46 equals 17802. Okay, right. So we need to introduce, let's think about where we might be going. We need to introduce a decimal point before the last digit in each of these numbers. And we also need to get this across down there. That's where we're aiming. So we could do this in various different orders, many different orders. Um, but let's just, well, I don't know, what, gets, what kills the most birds with the fewest stones? If we're really gonna start playing with that, uh, that old saying. Um, I think we should introduce some decimals. Why not? So the easiest way to do that, we're well, really the only way to do that, we want one decimal point before the end of as many numbers as possible, is we're going to divide by 10. So on the right, we're going to get 1780.2, which is what we ended up last time by coincidence, ended up with last time by coincidence. Now, this would be a mistake, what I'm about to write here, I'm about to do something wrong. So 38.7 times 4.6. Why is that wrong? Well, it's wrong, put a big cross here, just to make clear. It's wrong because we've divided by 10 on the right-hand side here, and then we've divided by 10 here and by 10 here. So we've actually divided the left-hand side by 100. We can only, if we're dividing by 10 on the right-hand side, we can only divide one of the numbers on the left by 10 because they're all multiplied together. So if we divide both of them by 10, we are, as I say, dividing by 10 times 10 or 100. Hope that makes sense. But this is correct. It would also be correct if you wrote 38.7 times 46. Doesn't matter where you divide by 10. Okay, so now we're that far. Now what can we do with this next? Well, if we keep dividing by 10, then we're gonna end up with 178.02 on the right, which is not this. So we don't want to go that far. So let's focus on the obvious next thing to do, which is turning this into a fraction. So we want to divide both sides. I'm gonna write a new row here. 387 times 4.6 equals 1780.2. So I'm writing the same thing out here just so I can show you. 
We want to get one on the right hand side. No, that's skipping a step. We want to get divided by 1780.2 over here. 1780.2 over here. And we have to do everything we do to both sides if we want it to stay the same. It's like algebra in that regard. So that's also going to be divided by 1780.2. So we divided both sides by 1780.2. What is this here? What is 2 divided into 2 bits? What is 10 divided into 10 bits? What is 1502 divided by 1502? It's always 1. If you divide something by itself, if you divide a number of things into the same number of things, you always get back to 1. So this over here becomes 1. Don't rub out, rub out the equal sign. Now we are pretty close to where we're aiming. So we go back here and we say, what's the difference? Well, the difference is here. That needs to be 0.7. So let's make that into 0.7. What have we done? We've divided by 10, by another 10. 38.7 divided by 10 times 4.6. So we need to divide the right-hand side by 10 as well. So what's going to happen there? If we want 38.7 times 4.6 over 1780.2, we need to divide the right-hand side by 1, and so by 10. And so we move the decimal point from there to there, so we get 0 0.1. So the answer is 0 0.1. I've just realized I forgot to write the answer. Oh, no, I didn't. It's there. Good. Going crazy, and we've only just started. Right, so that's how it works. You can do things in different orders. It's fiddly. It becomes fiddly once we're dealing with the fraction. It's recognizing that you're going to divide something by itself to get one. That's the really big step here. The rest of it, if you're reasonably comfortable with decimals and fractions, uh, makes sense in the end. Somebody says that I made a mistake. Where did I make a mistake? Where? Tell me where. Tell me where. Um, Akinogan, oh Lord of the universe. Why, thank you. Um, I'm in year four and don't know anything about 11 plus. Well, year four is a perfectly reasonable time for not knowing anything about the 11 plus because it is still a fair way away. You're starting your preparation. Um, I normally suggest to people they only really get going a proper past paper preparation at the big proper past paper preparation. That's a tongue twister at the beginning of year five. Um, and that you're at the stage where you should be working on your core skills, getting good at your core, you know, your maths knowledge, your grammar, enjoying writing stories, that kind of thing, doing lots of reading, making sure your spellings are good, blah de blah de blah And so if you don't know much about the actual 11 plus exams at this point, that is absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. And certainly if the maths we're looking at here is beyond you, really don't worry about it, because if you're in year four, we're pushing well in advance of things that you're likely to have covered. We're pushing well in advance of what most people will have covered actually for the 11 plus, because this is a very advanced, what I sort of notionally call scholarship level maths lesson. So do not worry about that. Well done for being here. Right, okay, this is a very wordy question. As you will see, the maths itself is not going to be particularly difficult, I think, but it's about being able to clearly line up what's going on and explain that clearly. For each of the following statements, write down whether it is definitely correct, possibly correct, or definitely incorrect. Okay, and you can see we've got answer boxes like this and explanation boxes. So in the answer box, you're going to be writing either, come on, scroll, there we are, definitely correct, possibly correct, or definitely incorrect. You're basically going to be copying out one of those phrases into that space mark answer. Explain each of your answers. You may wish to draw diagrams which will be marked as part of your explanations. So what this means in practice is that between what you draw and what you write, you need to have explained your answer sufficiently for the examiner to know that you understand and can basically explain the point. You might end up doing that purely with a clear diagram that covers everything, or you might do it purely with a written explanation that covers everything, or you might have a diagram and then a bit of explanation to put it in context. It doesn't really matter as long as across everything you've done, you have explained that, you have explained it. The question makes that clear. It doesn't say you need text, it doesn't say you need diagrams, it just says that you need to explain. I have two squares. The smaller square has an area of four centimeters squared. The larger square has an area of 64 centimeters squared. I could fit 16 of the smaller squares inside the larger square without overlapping. Okay, this is crying out for a diagram, isn't it? Here's a square. Honestly, it's a square. Just trust me on that. 
that's going to be the larger square because I can't fit a bigger one in. So let's do a smaller square. We don't need to draw it to scale in any way. There's a smaller square. Smaller square is an area of four centimeters squared. It's a square. So if it's an area of four, it must be two times two because that's the only way to do it. Larger square is an area of 64. That must mean that it's eight times eight because you know your times tables and you know that eight times eight is 64. I hope you do. Uh, unless you're just starting out, in which case maybe you don't. But in that case, now's the time to work out your times tables. So we've got a two times two square and an eight times eight square. How many times is this two times two square gonna fit into this one? Well, this length here is eight. This length is two. Two goes into eight four times. So that's gonna go in four times. And the same in this direction. Four times four. So four times that way and four times that way. So we can see that this definitely fits. Because these are squares, you can't squish them or change them in any direction because then wouldn't be squares anymore. So this must always be true. So we've shown that this is definitely correct. So that's what we write down. Definitely correct. It doesn't need to be beautiful, it just needs to be clear and it needs to be that exact phrase. If you write something like true or something, you will probably get away with it, but don't risk it. Just write down what they want you to write down, okay? Explanation. I think we have fully explained this, actually, using the diagram above. Um, um, so I could just write C diagram. I'm going to be slightly fuller than that, just to be certain. Um, I'm going to write... Um, uh, because... Now, I'm just doing a maths exam. I don't need to write full sentences. Uh, we are liberated from all that comprehension stuff. Because squares, not because these are squares, because squares, the diagram above will always apply. Okay, so I've explained, I've given a diagram, I've given a bit of explanation just to be sure, and I've written definitely correct. Onwards to the next. I have two circles. The smaller circle has an area of three centimeters squared. The larger circle has an area of 27 centimeters squared. I could fit nine of the smaller circles inside the larger circle without overlapping. What happens if we take an area of 27 centimeters squared and divide it by nine? We get three. So we can see that you can fit nine things of three centimeters squared into a 27 centimeter squared area. What happens if we do some circles? So let's do circle, circle, and circle. I'm not doing nine of them. I'm just, um, we're putting these inside a larger circle. Let's try another. Let's try it if we do them in a square. So I'm gonna do four of them here. And again, I'm gonna fit that into a larger circle. Well, what can we see? We always get gaps if the circles aren't overlapping. We've got a gap. We've got a gap. I'm going to label that. Okay. So what have we shown here? We've shown that if the circles fitted in with no gaps, then it would work. Exactly. But there must be gaps, and therefore it can't work. And now all we need to do is write a brief explanation just to explain what we've done. We can see that this is not right. It's definitely incorrect, to use a phrase from the question. Not probably, definitely. There is no way of doing this. There is no way of fitting nine three centimeter squared circles into a 27 centimeter squared bigger circle without overlapping. It just can't work because the only way for it to work would be if there were no gaps at all. And there must be gaps because they're circles. That's what we've shown. How can we explain that? Um, um, the small circles would need to completely fill the larger circle. Um, But this is impossible, brackets, diagram, just to indicate I've shown this. You can write C diagram, but again, I'm not trying to write in full sentences. This is just for a maths marker. Um, they don't worry about sentences and such like. But this is impossible, diagram, because there will 
be gaps. Okay, I think that's completely adequate. Um, it absolutely explains what's going on when you combine it with this here. The important thing as well is this, that I do have some working showing that I've done that division and worked out that it goes exactly. On to the next. So I think that one is kind of, it starts off looking really confusing because you think you have to do calculations about areas of circles and all that nonsense, but you really don't. It's just about applying your common sense. I said at the start, the maths in these is not particularly difficult. The hard thing is lining it up clearly and writing a sensible explanation that does the job. I have two rectangles. Okay, so it sounds a bit like our squares question at the top. The smaller rectangle has an area of six centimeters squared. The larger rectangle has an area of 24 centimeters squared. I could fit four of the smaller rectangles inside the larger rectangle without overlapping. Okay, perhaps you can see where this is going already. Let's see. So um, let's uh, do a large rectangle to work with, okay? Um, And what would be a sensible way of doing a 24 centimeters squared rectangle? Six times four is a nice convenient number to work with, I think. You could, def you could do other, other dimensions, but six times four is 24. Um, okay, and let's, a ma let's imagine, let's imagine um, a smaller rectangle. And what would be a thing that's six centimeters squared, three times two kind of makes sense. So this would fit in, two goes in this direction twice, and three goes in this direction twice. So two times two does equal four. So is this definitely correct? Well, how else can I make a smaller rectangle of area six centimeters squared? Let's look at that for a start. I could do it as six times one. So I could have a rectangle like that, that's six long and one high. Would that fit? Yes, it would. I could have four of them. Okay, so that works. Maybe it does always work. What happens if I have a small rectangle that is 12 centimeters long? And half a centimeter high. That would also have an area of six centimeters squared. And that would not fit in even once. So in fact, this is not necessarily true. It depends on the dimensions of the particular rectangles. It might be correct, or it might not be, to be correct, depending on the dimensions we're working with. So if you go back to our options at the top, this is in the possibly correct category. It might be correct, depending on the particular parameters that we are working with. So we write in here, possibly correct. Dimitri, what are you doing down there? What are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, I see. What are you doing? Oh, he's found a little bit of houseplant that's fallen off and he's having a nice chew, which is not the most terrible thing in the world, as long as he don't, doesn't move on to chewing the electrical cable that is right, right next to that piece of houseplant. And I'm not sure that would be a good idea because then your fur will be sticking up considerably more than it is at present. And we don't want that. We don't want to suddenly see your skeleton like in a cartoon when your teeth cut through the plastic of the cable. Let's put you over here and hope you don't go back. Right, so this is possibly correct. Um, but not necessarily. Um, explanation, um, we can make this really simple actually because the, the diagram shows it very clearly. Um, depending on the depending on the dimensions of the rectangles, it may or may not be true. C diagram, why not write C diagram just to be belt and braces, though I'm sure they're gonna see the diagram because hopefully the examiner isn't blind. They would be in the, probably be in the wrong job were that the case. Um, okay, depending on the dimensions of the rectangles, it may or may not be true. Uh, you could just write, to be honest, it depends on the dimensions of the rectangles that would do the same job, probably be a little bit more efficient, but I'm not changing it now. Let's move on. So I hope you've got a sense of how those questions work. That again, it's a kind of question style. It's not particularly common, but I have seen it um, just occasionally, that kind of thing. I think it's a really interesting kind of challenge, but it is tricky. It's testing your ability to understand and explain maths. Okay, 
This is something else in that category. In other words, it's the kind of question that you won't often see, but the reason it's in this paper that I've set is because it is a question of a sort that I have seen turn up. Um, I love this. Libby saying, OMG, Astroboost is here. I'm a huge fan, just after Astroboost's comment. Astroboost, you're a celebrity. I need to check out your channel. I must check out your channel. Let's all check out Astroboost's channel after this. In fact, I'm going to write it down. Check Astroboost channel. I've got no idea what Astroboost does on their channel, but um, I look forward to finding out. Well, I've written it down now, so I might actually do it. If I don't forget, I've written it down and just shred these papers before I get around to it. <laughs> okay. Give your answer to each of the following questions as an algebraic expression. As I said, this is difficult. Dif <laughs> it's conceptually difficult, but the questions are actually not too bad. Um, but it is the kind of thing that can turn up in some harder 11 plus exams, even if it's pushing the boundaries of the 11 plus syllabus. It gives you an example to help. For example, if I have C coconuts and then another two fall into my sack, I will have C plus two coconuts. What does that mean? It means that I had a certain number of coconuts. I don't know how many. I've called that number C. And then I've added two to that. So I have C added two. Here's C. Here's the added two. So I get C plus two. I can't give a number answer because I don't know what number C is. If someone then comes along and says, in fact, you had 12 coconuts before, then I know that C is 12, and so I can work it out by doing 12 plus 2, for example. But we're not doing that here. We're just coming up with the expressions like C plus 2, involving the unknown amount that we're given. Let's have a look at it. And if you don't understand what these questions mean, I hope that by the time I've gone through them, you will. Patronizing Paper, well-named company, um, I'm sure you'd all shop from them, recommends that customers buy N boxes of napkins for their first order. Okay, so in other words, they recommend a number, but we aren't told what the number is, so we're just calling it N. Maybe they change their recommendation every week, and that you know, maybe that's why, who knows. I decide to buy half this amount and two extra boxes. How many boxes of napkins do I buy? So they recommend that I buy N boxes of napkins, but I buy half of this amount. What's half of N? It's half of N. In fact, I'll put it this way, half of N. But in maths, as you know, if you've watched my channel before doing maths, and as you will now know if you haven't, of in maths is written as times. And when we're doing algebra, how do we write half times n? The answer is that you miss out the time symbol and you just write half n. So I buy half this amount, that's half n. And two extra boxes. Then another two fall into my sack. It's exactly the same. It's half n and two extras. How do I write and in maths? It's plus. How do I write two more boxes? Two. So the number of boxes is half of n, because I buy half the recommended amount, which is n, and two more, half n plus two. You could also write this as, the other very obvious way to write it is n over two, which is another way of saying half of n, plus two. That, that's also correct. It doesn't matter which of those you write, they're mathematically identical, and they're both fully simplified. So either of those answers is completely satisfactory. There are other ways you could write it, which I would not recommend because they're not so simple. Um, onwards, I hope that makes sense. Algebraic expressions, once you get the concept, um, at 11 plus are generally quite easy to work with. They don't tend to set really horrible things. Uh, although part D down here will challenge you a little bit, even if you've encountered these questions before, I think. Peter has P parrots. P parrots, so he has a certain number of parrots we don't know We've just called it P. Petra also keeps parrots, but only has 25% as many. How many parrots does Petra keep? I was watching, I saw a, like an online video yesterday, I just came across by chance, someone's social media, um, where there was a ventriloquist teaching how to say P by doing a T sound. And he was showing how if you do it right, you can do a T that sounds exactly like P, so you can say P without closing your mouth. Quite, it was absolutely extraordinary, completely convincing. And then I was sitting there going, tup, 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 tup. can't do it, can't do it. 
probably takes practice, like most things that are worth doing. Um, Peter has, is it worth doing? Discuss. Yeah, of course it is. Peter has pea parrots. Petra also keeps parrots, but does only 25% as many. And then that's it. Okay. So we just need to find 25% of P. Well, we know that of becomes times. We just covered that. We don't write 25% in algebraic expressions. Okay, basic bit of knowledge. We use decimals or fractions. So what's 25%? It's 0.25. And if you don't know that immediately, then you need to work on your decimals and percentages conversions. I'm not gonna go into the detail of why now, that's another lesson that I've already done in the past. Look back for my videos, find decimals and percentages, and you'll see this explained in more detail. 0.25 times P, and of course, as we covered before, when you've got a times between a number and a letter, you get rid of it. So it's just 0.25p. It is as easy as that. Otherwise, you could write this if you were being, that's the most obvious way to write it, and that's what I would do. You could also write that as, you know that p 0.25 is a quarter, so you could write it as a quarter p, or you could write it as p over four. By the way, you don't need to write these ors in your answer. I'm just showing you other ways you might write it in case you came up with something else and are wondering whether it's correct or not. Okay, so it's simple. P parrots, she has only 25% of that number, so it's 25% of P, which is 0.25 of P, which is 0.25 P. Easy as that, because of is times, and the times disappears. Last year I scored M marks in my end of year maths exam. Oh, by the way, you might be wondering, would you get the marks if you wrote it with a times, if you wrote 0.25 times P? The simple answer to that question is I don't know. The point of this lesson is just to teach you to do it right. Uh, if you do it right, you definitely will get the marks. If you write 0.25 times P, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Um, it depends on the marker. Um, I would probably mark that as correct if I were marking. Last year I scored M marks on my end of year maths exam. This year I scored 20% more. Okay, what mark did I score this year? So I scored M marks last year, and this year I also scored M marks and some more. How do I write and in maths? It's a plus sign. Okay, so it's M plus 20%. 20, hang on, plus 20% of what? 20% of my finger? 20% of my phone case? 20% of the temptations left in Dimitri's box. No product placement here. Um, oh, I should get a cut from temptations with the number I feed him around these lessons, but anyway. Um, so uh, it's Whiskers, actually, the company. Uh, so we got plus 20% of what? Of M, okay? Plus 20% of M, and I put that in brackets to show that 20% of M is one idea. Okay, M plus 20% of M. What's 20% of M? Well, we just dealt with that up there, didn't we? That's 0.2m. Again, if you don't know why, have a look at the relevant video about percentages and decimals. m is, of course, 1m. You don't write the 1, but let's write it in to remind ourselves. So 1m and 0.2m's is 1.2m. So what mark did I score this year? I scored 1.2m's, okay? Simple as that. You've scored 20% more. That's 20% more than 120%. So the other way you could think of it is you could write, just do a divide, you could write 120% of M, and then the of becomes times. 120% becomes 1.2. And then you get rid of the times because between a number and a letter, the times goes. Simple. You could, if you were being if you're being particularly obstreperous, you might choose to write this as six fifths of M, but frankly, I can't see why you would. 1.2 is absolutely fine. Get rid of that, because it's kind of in the way. Right, and now we're on to the beastie at the bottom. So really, in the way I structured this, A, B, and C were training you with the necessary skills, or some of them, to approach part D, which is a much more involved, and I think, in my opinion, uh, which is utterly unbiased, a more interesting problem. Xavier bakes X biscuits. Aurelie bakes three times as many biscuits as Xavier. Quintana bakes three biscuits fewer than Xavier. No social stereotyping going on in the setting of this question. Right, Aurelie, um, 
by the way, for anyone watching this whose name's Xavier, Aurelie, or Quintana, I think these are absolutely wonderful names, genuinely. Um, I think there should be more people named like this in the world, and it would be a brighter place. Aurelie breaks three breaks. No, she bakes. Maybe she breaks them too. Three times as many biscuits as Xavier. Okay, this one's easy. What's three times x? Three times x is, of course, three x, because we just get rid of the times. That's what Aurelie bakes. Quintana bakes three biscuits fewer than Xavier. What's fewer? That's, you know, less than in everyday English, I guess. Um, so it's Xavier's amount less minus, so less than or fewer than is minus, minus three. What am I talking about? No, sorry. As in, it's x take away three, which is three fewer than x. That's what I'm trying to say, but English is going because it's too much maths. How many more biscuits does Orly bake than Quintana? Hmm. Now what I've done here is something that I really recommend doing when you've got a problem like this. Any kind of maths problem where you have to work bits out that are linked to the words in the question. It can be really helpful to write some working notes alongside the question. If they're clear, and they're clearly, you know, alongside the relevant bits of the question, they should also be, you know, seen and marked by an examiner. They're part of your working, it's a nice clear way to set it out. How many more biscuits Orly bake than Quintana? So, how do I find how much more something is than something else? If I said how many more is five than three, how would I do that? I'd do five, take away three, and the difference would be how much more. So we need to take away, it's as easy as that. We need to do, how many more does she bake than Quintana? So it's orally minus Quintana. Okay, it's as easy as that. What did orally bake? She baked three X biscuits. How many did Quintana bake? She, ba she baked x minus three. We've got minuses mixed in here, so I'm putting this in brackets. So we've got three x minus x minus three. Now this is where you need to know a little bit of algebra skill. So we've got three x minus x minus three. So we're taking away an x. We're also taking away a minus three. Now, brain cells on. What is minus minus three? What's that? Minus a minus is a plus. It's plus three, otherwise known as three, but also known as plus three. So minus minus three becomes plus three. Now, why is that? I think there's a really easy way to think of it. Imagine a number line, here's a zero. Okay, zero is in the middle of the number line. The plus numbers are going up here. So we've got one, two, three. And we've got a negative number line that runs down here. Minus one, minus two, and minus three. If you think about pluses and minuses, um, it's really useful to have a number line in your head. When I'm doing maths, um, not that I do a huge amount of very serious maths, that's a lie, I do no very serious maths, but um, when I'm doing any maths, including aforementioned serious maths, I would still have number lines in my head. I find, personally, I find them very useful for visualizing things. Um, you just don't necessarily need to draw them, but you can if it's useful. We've got Minus three, that means we're going in this direction. Okay, that's minus three. But if I need to minus a minus three, it means that I am undoing the minus three. I'm doing the reverse of the minus three. So I'm doing minus three, this is probably the best way to do it. I'm doing minus three in the backwards direction because I'm doing the minus of minus three. So that's minus of minus three, minus three in the backwards direction. And that takes me to plus three. Okay, so that's why minus minus three is plus three, which is a very long way we're coming back to here. We've got three X minus X plus three. Three X's take away one X gives us two X. We've got three, imagine you've got a fruit called an Excel. I've got my three Excels here. I take away one Excel. I have got two Excels left. Okay, so 2x plus 3. I should be saying cookies, really, or biscuits. Biscuits, we're in England here. Um, um, well, you are. Who knows where I am? Um, so we've got 2x plus 3, and that is indeed our answer. It also happens to be the answer I got earlier, which is at least mildly reassuring. Okay, so there were a few steps in there. We worked out Orly and Quintana's biscuits, and these were each problems similar to the ones we've done in parts A, B, and C. And then we have to combine those by subtracting, because we're finding the difference between Orly and Quintana. In maths, you find a difference by subtracting. 
so we subtracted, and when we subtracted, we had to pay attention to the fact that when you take away a minus three, you reverse it, see the number line down here, and so we got plus three. That's it. Relatively straightforward, if you know all that, st all that stuff, which in a, is a way of saying it's not that straightforward, and if you happen to get this right independently before watching this lesson, you're a star. You're all stars anyway, but you're a special star in that case. I can see I'm losing live viewers. People are just going, what is this? What is this rubbish? Why do I need to know this? Sorry, guys. Felix is baking cakes. By the way, this is the last question that we're looking at today. Question nine here. And there are three parts, A, B, and C. So when you finish part C, although that is not to be taken for granted because part C is a bit of a monster, but when you finish part C, um, you will be done with the maths today, which I think is something that we will all be celebrating. What fraction of the cakes are banana cakes? I don't know, let's read the information. Felix is baking cakes. Okay, we have biscuits and now we got cakes. Three fifths of the cakes are carrot cakes and the rest are banana cakes. Three quarters of the carrot cakes contain cherries while a third of the banana cakes do. Oh, so much information. So much information. Question A, what fraction of the cakes are banana cakes? Phew. Something relatively straightforward. The key with a question like this, a wordy problem, is that you need to locate the relevant information. Okay? First of all, what fraction of banana cakes? Well, where do we find that? The rest are banana cakes. The rest of what? The rest that are not carrot cakes. What fraction are carrot cakes? Three fifths. And the rest are banana cakes. So. All of them together is the whole amount, which we call one in maths. One take away three fifths is two fifths. That's another way of saying if you've got five fifths and you take away three of them, you'll have two left. So two fifths of the cakes are banana cakes. That wasn't so hard, was it? We just had to find the right information in the question and do a pretty simple bit of fractions. What fraction of all the cakes contain cherries? Well, we don't know what fraction of all the cakes contain cherries. That's the point, and that's why we have to work it out. But we do know that three quarters of the carrot cakes contain them, and a third of the banana cakes do. Okay, so it's going to be, and I'm gonna do something that I think is very useful to do um, whenever you have a question like this, even though you don't have to do it to get the marks. Uh, and it does take a bit more time, but it's very good to get your thoughts in order. Three quarters of, so I'm writing it out, Using words, three quarters of carrot cakes. Okay. Um, and, which is plus, a third of the banana cakes. But then I can see straight away I've got these ofs and they're gonna become timeses. So I've got three quarters times the number of carrot cakes, plus a third times the number of banana cakes. But we don't know the numbers of these cakes because we don't know how many cakes there are in total. What we got are fractions. So equals three quarters times the carrot cakes are three fifths of the cakes. We're told that up here at the start. So three quarters of three fifths of the cakes plus, I'm writing this in underneath the information we got, plus a third of the banana cakes. The banana cakes are two-fifths of the cakes. We just work that out. So what's three-quarters of three-fifths plus a third of two-fifths? Well, let's work it out. And now we're timesing fractions together, and if you don't know how to do this, I have videos about it on the channel. Basically, it's really simple. You times the top and times the bottom. Three times three is nine. Four times five is 20. So we've got nine twentieths. Make sure I haven't made some egregious mistake. Not yet, I'm sure it will come. Plus, and I'm, now I'm not gonna write it under here because I'm running a bit short of space. Plus, so we're looking over here. One times two is two. Over three times five is 15. So plus two fifteenths. Nine twentieths plus two fifteenths. So now all we have to do is add these fractions. How do you add fractions? You look at my video on how to add fractions so that you remember, and then you come back and do this. You say we need these to be over the same amount. So we need a common denominator. What do 20 and 15 both go into? 20, 40, no, 15 doesn't go into that. 60, 15 does go into that. Put them both over 60. 
Okay? We've times 20 by 3 to get 60, so we need to times 9 by 3 as well. 27. We've times 15 by 4 to get 60, so we need to times 2 by 4 as well. 2 times 4 is 8. 27 sixtieths and 8 sixtieths, like 27 and 8 anythings, anythings is 35 sixtieths. And now we just need to simplify that. What do these both divide by? They both divide by 5, obviously, because one ends in 5, one ends in 0. Sorry, not the microphone. Uh, divide 35 by 5 and we get 7. You know that. 60 divided by 5, we get 12. You know that too. So the answer is 7 twelfths. What fraction of all the cakes contain cherries? 7 twelfths. Let's just recap that a second because I know it was complicated. We know that three quarters of the carrot cakes contain cherries and a third of the banana cakes. And I've written that out in full at the top. So I've got three quarters times the carrot cakes. The carrot cakes are three fifths of the cakes. And I've got a third times the banana cakes. The banana cakes are two fifths of the cakes. So again, in this line, I've just written that information in. And now I've got something to calculate. And I just need to do the multiplications. And then I, need to, then I do the addition. Okay? Don't forget your um, bod mass or bid mass. You do the division or multiplication before you do the addition or subtraction. And that's it. You just do those stages using the skills that you either have learnt or will learn um, as you cover fractions. And then you get the answer, hopefully. Right. Part C. The Beast. This is a very tricky question. It's not that difficult to do once you know what you're doing. The trouble is that it's fairly tricky to know what you're doing. I'm trying to think. I've thought about I think I'm going to show you two ways of doing it. The question is which way I show you first. I think what I will do is show you the harder way first and then show you what I think is a much easier way of doing it. Because these are both methods that... Oh no, what have you... Don't, don't, don't lie down there then. If I move my chair, you're liable to get your end of your tail caught under the edge of the chair. Um, well, it didn't hurt very much because he's just lying there going... Okay, um, what fraction of the cakes not containing cherries are banana cakes? So we need to think about the cakes not containing cherries. We need to look at banana cakes and all the cakes not containing cherries. So again, using some words, let's start setting this out. Let's look at banana cakes Banana, no, banana, banana, no cherries. And let's, let's work that one out. So what do we know? We know that, um, what have you got? We know that banana cakes is two fifths of the cakes. But what about banana cakes not containing cherries? Well, a third of the banana cakes do contain cherries, so therefore two-thirds don't. So it's two-fifths of two-thirds, which is a times, as you know, as we explained already. Of, in maths, is times. Out of is divide, but of is times. Okay? So it's two-fifths times two-thirds. Yes, I am occasionally checking my notes to make sure I'm not leading you in some crazy direction. Uh, my excuse is I'm thinking about streaming and your comments and the cat and everything, so I could make a mistake. The real reason is that I often make mistakes. Two times two is four. Five times three is fifteen. Okay? Banana no cherries. That's four fifteenths of all the cakes. That's what we've worked out. Okay? Now, what fraction of all the cakes have no cherries. All cakes. Banana, no cherries. All cakes, no cherries. I think the comma just clarifies a little bit. How can we work this out? So, all the cakes, without well, the ones that don't have cherries, well, we know that seven twelfths, so we've got some working here already done, seven twelfths contain cherries. So how many don't contain cherries? Take 7 twelfths away from 1. 1 minus 7 twelfths is what's left over between 7 and 12, 5. 5 twelfths. 
Again, if you don't understand that, look at my videos on fractions. I'm skipping over a lot of core maths here that I'm taking for granted. If you don't take it for granted, if you don't know why the leftover is 5 twelfths, look at some of my videos on basic fraction skills. I've got a core maths playlist on the channel. It's called Core Maths, and you'll find basic stuff there. Or look at my uh, file called Video List, which is linked in the video description down below on YouTube, up there on Facebook. Go to that file, and you'll see a list of all my videos ever and um, that will help you out, I hope. So, banana cakes with no cherries are four fifteenths of the cakes. All cakes with no cherries are five twelfths of the cakes. We need to know what fraction of, so what fraction of is divided by, okay? So, we need to know what fraction of, I'll do it down here, so we can keep the other side free for the other method I'm going to show you, of all the cakes are banana cakes. So out of all the cakes, all the cakes without cherries are 5 twelfths. The banana cakes are 4 fifteenths. We're just plugging in what we've worked out already. So we've got 4 fifteenths divided by 5 twelfths. Now, if you don't know how to divide fractions, look at my relevant video. That may be a refrain you've heard. If you've watched that, you know that what you do is simply that you turn the second fraction always the second fraction upside down and change it to a multiplication sign. So we've got 4 fifteenths times 12 over 5. And then if you know about multiplying fractions, which you'll know if you've watched the relevant videos, um, I'm so boring, I'm so repetitive, but I have to keep repeating this because otherwise people don't get them. Um, when you're multiplying fractions, and only when you're multiplying fractions, not when you're adding or subtracting or dividing, you can cancel diagonally, which is useful because 15 and 12 are both in the 3 times table. Divide them by 3. 12 divided by 3 is 4. 15 divided by 3 is 5. We've got 4 times 4 over 5 times 5 is 16 over 25. I can't believe I said that all in one breath. <gasps> or why I said it all in one breath. Anyway, that's the answer. 16 and 25, they're not in the same, time, same times tables, so they don't simplify. So the answer is 16 25ths. What fraction of the cakes not containing cherries are banana cakes? 16 25ths of them. Phew! Right, let's look at another way of doing this, um, which I think is simpler. That, I want to emphasize, is conceptually really difficult in my opinion. I think that is just plain hard, very hard. There is, I think, a slightly easier way to think about it. When we were looking at part B, we noticed that a good number to work with that we can sort of fit out all the fractions into in this question is 60. So let's play a what if game. What if there were 60 cakes? What numbers would we then be, then be working with? So if 60 cakes, okay, then well, what fraction of the cakes contain cherries? 35 sixtieths. So 35 of the cakes would have cherries. So how many of the cakes wouldn't have cherries? 25. 60 minus 35 is 25. Okay, if 60 cakes, 60 minus 35 equals 25 have no cherries. Okay. So now we're working with actual numbers rather than fractions, and therefore I think it's a lot easier to line up the concepts, in my opinion, for me. I often like to try and convert theoretical things into real-world situations so I can imagine them and then the maths is easier. So 25 have no cherries. Um, what, a, um, yeah. what about the banana cakes? How many banana cakes would there be in all? Oops. Banana cakes total. So we're dealing with, oh yeah, banana cakes are two fifths of them all. So that's two fifths of 60. What's a fifth of 60? It's 12, so it's 24. You could work that out in stages, but let's just skip that because I want to get through this. If banana cakes total is two fifths of 60 is 24. What about banana cakes? Banana, I keep writing banana, banana cakes, banana cakes. Am I writing what? Oh yeah, because I'm writing with. Banana with out, yeah, because that's what we're dealing with, not containing cherries. Banana without cherries. So we know there were 24 banana cakes. Without cherries, 
third of banana cakes do, so two thirds don't. What's two thirds of 24? It's 16 because a third is eight. Okay, so um, just make sure I'm not doing something absolutely ridiculous. Um, I am doing something ridiculous. Oh no, no I'm not, phew, phew. I thought I made a terrible mistake, but I haven't. That is a relief because I often make those. Right, what fraction of the cakes not containing cherries? That's 25, so it's out of 25. Are banana cakes without cherries? That's 16. 16 out of 25, which is the same answer that we got before. Okay, I'm not going to go through that one again because I think I did it in quite a lot of detail. The best way for me to go through it again is for you to rewind the video and watch it. Either of these methods is fine. This method here is the more kind of pure mathsy, and this method here is the more kind of applied mathsy method, where you apply this to an imaginary situation with an imaginary number of cakes and work out what the fraction would be in that situation. If you imagined 120 cakes, for example, you'd end up with the same answer. You might just have to do some simplifying. And that's it for the maths here. Whoa, this is, this has been a difficult, difficult bit of maths. Let's skip to the tip of the week. At which point I realize that my tip of the week must be write down a to-do list and follow it because what I've got a fluff on my neck. Yeah, looks like some kind of big sort of boil or something, but it's a bit of fluff. Um, Dimitri, you've been depositing fluff everywhere. The tip of the week is have a to-do list and remember things like preparing a tip of the week because I've just realized that I completely forgot to. So there is no tip of the week this week. Okay. Time for some questions if there are any. Are there any questions? Um, sorry, I was shooting busy. I completely forgot about the lesson today. What were you shooting? I'd be very interested to know. Um, much sympathy to the shot being or item. Um, messy, uh, that is my handwriting, although I think you might be talking about a footballer. Is anyone going into year seven? Not me, I am considerably too old, very sadly. Um, Astribute, this is one of my last lessons. I might do another, but this could be the last. I know you've done your 11 plus, haven't you? And you've done very well. Um, so it's amazing that you're still here. So it's been wonderful to have you and I hope you slip back into the channel occasionally. Uh, what was the answer for question 1B? I think I've dealt with that in the video. You know what? Nobody's asking questions. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. I'm going to seize the moment and escape. Um, yeah, oh, it's been quite long, a lot of maths. So Dimitri, come up here. Come up, boy. Oy. Up we come. We're going to say goodbye. Thank you very much for joining through this lesson. As I said at the start, one thing you should do, check out the links in the video description. Take that as the tip of the week. There's so much useful stuff in there, stuff in there, including lots of really useful free things, um, which I hope you'll find help you with your 11 plus preparation. They certainly helped Dimitri with his preparation. Come up onto my shoulder. That's it. Wow, Mr. Floppy. Um, so yeah, download and benefit. And the main thing is, Come back here at six o'clock next Tuesday evening for the next Easy 11 Plus live lesson. Dimitri's off. We're going to be looking at creative writing. He's off to prepare the lesson. We're going to be looking at how you edit a story that you've written to make it even better, which is a really, really important stage of the writing process, whether you're under exam time pressure or whether you're doing it at your leisure. Bye bye. It's been fantastic to have you and I will see you next week. Dimitri, come back. Dimitri, Dimitri, I've got a treat for you. Dimitri, oh, he's coming. Come on, boy. Here's a treat. Here's a treat. Look, a treat. Ah, oh, that's a happy cat.